My name is Judge, and I have gained control over my life by committing myself to say, stay drug free, live my life spiritually, finding out who I am and helping others that they too can escape this death that we know as drug addiction. Hi, my name is Dorothy. I've learned to stop lying, to stop lying to myself and others that I'm that addict and getting on with my life. To me, it means to change my attitude and behavior to a positive and full force recovery of all chemical abuse. The more honest I am with myself, the more I pull my strength from my heritage as a black woman. Being honest to myself, for myself, and for my children and the people around me, then I'll become a better person, a better, have a be, be a better employer, a better employee, and a better person and a mother to my children. My name is Mia, and um, I gain control over my, I mean, <laughs> I learned to accept who I am um, when I got into recovery because out there in the drug world, I had an identity crisis. All right. My name, my name is Leolis Martin. To feel my real feelings, I'm glad to be here, and I'm blessed in Jesus' name. My name is Paul. I came to realize the pain and hurt that I gave to my family today and today I'm staying drug free. Thank you. The first time I was raped by a man, I was 11 years old. Forgiving others always seemed pretty easy to me because I had it in my head. The only thing I had to do is let you go ahead, hurt me, rape me, beat me, get it over with. Maybe you'll love me afterwards. But when it came time to forgive myself, that was a whole different story. And in recovery, I finally learned how to forgive myself. Thank you. My name is Donna, and to rebirth a new life means to renew myself, seeking life to its fullest, uh, seeking life to its fullest in a recovery frame of mind without using drugs. Hi, my name is Eddie Franks. To live my spirituality means for me to start telling the truth. Therefore, I stop lying, I stop denying. Therefore, I can open up so that my spirituality come out so that I can truly be free. My name is Jamal. To support and love my brothers and sisters, I cannot be what I ought to be unless you are what you ought to be, which means we must reach out unconditionally with love. Our terms of resistance are to gain control over our lives, to, gain control over our lives. to stop lying, to, stop lying. To, be to be honest with myself, to accept who I am, to, who I am. to feel my real feelings, to feel my, real feelings. To feel my pain, to, feel my pain. <laughs> to forgive myself and forgive others, to, forgive myself and forgive others. to rebirth. A new, life. a new life to live my spirituality, to, live my spirituality. To, support and love my to support and love my brothers and sisters lie
And now the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. We don't want to say that again. <laughs> before you were born, I sanctified you. These, of course, are the words that come from Jeremiah as he prepares to engage in his prophecy. He knew that there were certain things that had occurred in his life which had given him sanctification means eminence. It means to be exalted, to be elevated, to be great, to be mighty. It means to be magnified. It means to be redeemed. It means to be regenerated. It means to be converted. It means to be saved, to be born, to have rebirth. That's what sanctification is. It means to be consecrated and dedicated. It means to be set apart. Sanctification means to be blessed. And so here we are today, blessed. Blessed because we now can define from our own perspective ways by which we can live our lives in love, in commitment, that can turn a nation around because this nation which we live in called America is grounded in force. This nation believes that the way you deal with a problem is that you you bring those forces into play which will make it that kind of experience by which you use the apparatus you already have set up to take away the problem which is to take away the people which is to not deal with the problem which is to just set the people in a place where the problem still exists and it sets apart those who don't want to get involved, those who want to be apathetic, those who don't want to make a commitment, it sets them apart and says to them, it's not ours, it belongs to them. And I'm here to say to you that the message we must take out is that the criminal justice system will not solve our problem. And I want Mr. Bennett, I want Mr. Bennett to get a clear picture so he will understand. And anybody else who works on policy in regards to drugs, that we've had enough of our sons and daughters and brothers and sisters being arrested, going to jail, losing their children, giving up what they have for somebody else to move the problem away from the people that they don't want the problem to touch. Now, now, now let me be honest with you, the people they don't want the problem to touch are those in America who use the criminal justice system to do all of their bidding. I understand that Mr. Bennett has made a statement today in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> the federal anti-drug drug chief, William Bennett, said, 
Friday that some neighborhoods are so infested with drugs that children should be removed from them and placed in orphanages. Let me tell you, Mr. Bennett, you are not going to get our children. We're going to keep them. They belong to us. tired of y'all telling us anyway about what we gonna do and what we not gonna do. So you might as well pull your troops and everybody else back because it's recovery time. We going home to the public housing projects and we're going to our sons and daughters and our uncles and aunties and our grandfathers and grandmothers and our sisters and our brothers. We're going home. We're going home to the public housing project. And they're going to they put our kids in orphanages. I mean, it sounds like this is Nazi Germany. Don't make black folks mad now. We tried to be cool and calm and handle this thing with as much sensitivity as we can. But don't you push us too far. Don't push us too far. You see, it, what people don't understand is that black folks have been sanctified. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying other folks haven't been sanctified either. <laughs> but I know about black folks. When you go through slavery, when your four parents are separated because of the color of their skin, when your four parents are brought from Mother Africa and put on a foreign land and have all of their values and all of their history snatched from their bosom. When you take a people and say to them, you are not worth anything till my soul make profit for me. When you do that to a people and then separate and segregate people that try to program their minds and their hearts and yet and yet a people survive you've got to understand we've been sanctified it's not all I doing before we were formed, God had something to do with it. See, what we got to do, my brothers and my sisters, is we've got to take a message, a very clear message from this conference. The clear message has to do with the fact that we are now moving as a people. And we got white brothers and sisters, Asian American brothers and sisters, Latino Hispanic brothers and sisters, Native American brothers and sisters, black, we are coming together. And once we get the message, once we get our bearing, once we get our destiny, once we understand the melody of our life, we can improvise and extemporize. We like jazz music. We can go on out there. Don't you know that? We know the melody of our lives. We know who we are. I'm Cecil Williams, born in San Angelo, Texas with five brothers and one sister in the family. I'm Cecil Williams, who had a breakdown when he was 12 years old because he couldn't understand why he was rejected because he was black. I'm Cecil Williams, who went to school 
And my mother and father said to all of us, get your education. And if you get your education, you can really be somebody in America. I'm the Cecil Williams who went to school and got educated. I'm also the Cecil Williams who found out that I don't care how much education I got, I still ain't got it made. This is America. And even though the walls are crumbling in Eastern Europe, and even though Mandela has been released in Southern Africa, we still have on our agenda racism and classism in America that we've got to overcome. I'm the Cecil Williams who went to Southern Methodist University, one of the first blacks there, and thought I was too much. I'm the Cecil Williams that graduated from Southern Methodist University and tried to be erudite, learned. And the old sister told me the first church I went to, she said, son, put down that manuscript and start preaching. I'm the Cecil Williams who put down that manuscript and began to preach. I'm the Cecil Williams who will never forget his roots. I'm the Cecil Williams, no matter where I work and whom I work with, I'm the Cecil Williams who will always know what my priorities are. I'm the Cecil Williams who knows that the priority is suffering. Now what, is, let's say something about suffering because I want you to take this with you. To suffer means to live your pain. To suffer means to live your hurt. But you see, that's America's problem. America's problem is that it engages in the Greek term called apatheia, apathy. Now apathy just doesn't mean non-involvement. Apathy means those who are running away from pain, hurt, and suffering. So you could be sitting here today thinking that you are not apathetic, but I tell you, if you don't live through your pain and your suffering and grow from it and learn from it and make it happen with you to not make you a better person and a stronger person, you are not then engaging in the kind of suffering that Jesus knew about. For it was Jesus who said, I will be with you. It was the Jesus who took the cross and did not know what the end would be, but expected that he would die. And on that third day, see people, I said to my congregation the other week, I said people are worried about did Jesus walk out the tomb? Did somebody steal Jesus' body? All the scholars are discussing how Jesus' body got out the tomb. I ain't gonna worry about that stuff. I know that there was victory on Sunday morning. That there, when the rock rolled away from the tomb, that there was a spirit created manifest through Jesus and he said to us go on I'm gonna stay with you walk together children and don't get weary talk together children and don't give up we got a spirit that's what that's what sanctification means it means being alive you know means being alive oh it's so difficult let, let me tell you what has made a lot of our folks alive. It's recovery time. And if it's recovery time, what has made our folks alive is the fact that basically what you have to do is always tell the truth. And if you tell the truth, 
what can easily happen is you get in touch with reality again. This is why it's important for those folks to say what they say. See, these are our terms of faith and resistance. Now, let me be honest with you, because I'm not going to deceive anybody on this issue. Folks are always, every time the press come around, aren't, aren't these the 12 steps? No. <laughs> these are terms of faith and resistance. I ain't putting down the 12 steps, but can't we create something too? Can't we start with the church? Can't we let the church speak for itself? Are we not the church? And I, I always worried about, did you get that from somebody else? I can create too. They think they're the only ones that create. And the next time some blessed person comes up to me and says, is that the 12 step program? I'm going to give it to you so you can have it. <laughs> See, these are our terms. They grew from the African American community. They grew from pain and hurt. We tried to run, we tried to deny, we tried to reject it, we tried to be dishonest, and we couldn't. And when we came together three years ago, something began to happen. And what began to happen is we began to tell the truth. Yeah. Our own story, tell the truth. Wherever you are, tell the truth. Yeah. See, what we don't understand is that when we tell the truth, we are living the truth in Jesus. Yeah. But let me tell you what truth is. See, a lot of people think that Jesus wanted people to obey the law and obey the ritual and all that, that kind of stuff. Jesus, even on the Sabbath, walked in one day and they were waiting on him. There was a man there who needed healing. And, and they said, Jesus, are you going to heal him? Jesus didn't stand up there and say, well, let me see. <laughs> Jesus walked over and caught that withered hand and said to that man, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Now you got to understand, if you live the truth, you're living the faith. And Jesus is the truth. See, Jesus is not concerned about all rules and regulations. Jesus is concerned about spirit. Jesus is concerned about life. Jesus is concerned about doing things. Jesus is concerned about accepting people no matter who they are or where they come from. You, 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 you go back and tell some of your folks, whomever they are, in the black community, that we better deal with drugs in openly and honestly, and we certainly better deal also with AIDS openly and honestly, because it's a double killer just like everything else. We gotta deal with AIDS. Now, what am I trying to say this morning? I'm saying that we have our own terms of faith and resistance. Amen. We'll be happy to pass them out after this is over. <laughs> what I'm really saying, my brothers and my sisters, is that wherever people are, we can be there. Now, that's one thing. Now, let's talk about that deals with the individual's recovery. Let's talk about going public. Amen. Going public means that we got to get up from where we are and begin to look at where we need to go. And I'm convinced that a lot of us probably know where we need to go. We know that we need to go where our folks are. Now, if they're on the corner, in the mix, you don't know what the mix is, that's where everything happens. Yeah, we need to go where the mix is. Get in the mix. That's right. Now, be careful about who you take with you, but get in the mix. <laughs> get in the mix. When you get in the mix, know that that's where 
hurt and pain is also. See, we're not the only one hurt and painting. All them folks, young, old, middle, I don't care who it is, they're hurting too. But we've chosen to go to public housing. I'm here to let you know that there's an article in the morning's paper, The Examiner, which is the afternoon paper, which details some of the things that have happened in, in regards to that video that you saw. I'm sure that the chief of police is here and I'm sure that Captain Herbal is here from the mission station. I'm going to bring some of these folks up there after a while. I'm sure that there are people who, from Valencia Gardens, they're going to come up after a while. I'm going to bring Alex up after a while. But what I want you to hear is in two months, strong arm robbery has gone down 75%. Assaults have had a 15% reduction. Residential burglary has gone down 50%. Thefts over $400 have gone down 80%. Auto theft is down 33%. Other theft is 75% reduction. Other police reports, 9% reductions. I want you to hear just a little bit of what the captain wrote me the other day. Let me assure you that the intercession of Glide Memorial at Valencia Gardens as of February 17, 1990 has already in less than two months resulted in a reduction of reported crime, a decrease in the fear of crime, and a resurgence in pride and hope. Now I want you to hear me, wherever we go, we're not going to go to have people arrested. I'm not into having people arrested. We have too many of our young that have been arrested. Do you know that we are 5% of the world population in America and we consume 80% of the drugs in the world? See, that's why Bush needs to change his policy and deal with the fact that we are an addicted community. We are addicted society. See, what we're not dealing with is that addiction is rampant everywhere. And for him to only try to focus on trying to get the countries where the drugs are coming from, and that's why they rejected him, by the way. They said, you go back home and clean up your own backyard. See, what we need to do is come to understand that time after time after time, it is the consumption, it's the demand. We're always trying to get high. We want to feel good. We want to be lifted up. We want to think like we got something going for us when we're hurting so deep inside. And so we go to drugs or whatever. I don't know my brothers and my sisters, but I know this, I know this, that it is time for you and me to begin a new movement. So therefore, as of today, I'm asking you as members of this assemblage to agree with me that we will not hold a national conference next year. But what we will do is we will leave from here and begin to march and demonstrate and go back home to our people and work with them in public housing or wherever they are. It is time for the wheel to start squeaking. See, if we keep meeting, we can leave feeling good <laughs> and then get back home and say, Lord, didn't we do it? What we must do is go back home 
and get in touch with every agency and every neighborhood group and every action group and get in touch with children and women and grandmothers and grand get in touch with everybody get to churches it's time for church members to stop just going to church on Sunday yeah <laughs> yeah Going to church on Sunday and get up there and do all that shouting and yelling and screaming and leave and go home and gossip the rest of the day. It's time to march now. It's time to put on your walking shoes. It's time to gird up your loins. It's time to put some dust on your feet. It's time to let it be known that we as a community, we as a black people marched in the 60s, the 50s and the 60s and a little bit in the 70s. We are now on the march again. Now, let me say something to the press so you'll understand, sir. I want you to know that when we march back home, don't be talking about black folks marching against black folks. We're not marching against our folks. We're just going back home. We're going with unconditional love. We're going to extend ourselves. We're going to bring in our resources. We're going to make sure that all poor people, no matter who they are, that we are extending our lives to them and that we're doing it from the street. If they live in the street, we're doing it from the street. You see. Also, let me say to the press, I'm sick and tired of seeing every time somebody's arrested, every time you show, show something about drugs, it's black folks on the screen. Are white people being arrested too? Yeah. Well, put a few of them in there. Mix it up. sending us insensitive racist reporters they come there trying to do you in and they're not interested in the problem see as soon as Alex began to change they got disinterested see if Alex was out there with his gun If Alex was out there with his gun, standing up, shooting at somebody with his group, oh, they'd be, they wouldn't get too close, but they would be reporting that. But now Alex is talking about coming home and loving and sharing and giving and helping. He said, when you help, it changes you. You hear me? There are a lot of Alex's sitting out there. 60% of the people in our recovery program were once pushers. 60%. I'm going to go on home now. See, we want now the press to at least begin to talk about recovery. Yes, now, if we don't get things worked out in public housing, then we're going to go to the courthouse. Yeah. And we're going to City Hall. See, some folks say, let's go to Washington. No. Let's show them what we can do at home first. And then when Felton May gives us the signal to come to Washington, we'll go to Washington. 
But let's stay at home first. Let's work at home. Let's go home, y'all. Isaiah, Isaiah, in one passage around the 60th chapter, talks about our sun arise. That's right, you got it, you got it. Arise. Listen, listen. Isaiah says, Arise, arise. Come on, where are you? Here you are. <laughs> I want to make sure I get it all in here. Oh, I'm going to take my time. Arise! Arise and shine! For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. I say the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let me throw it some to you, okay? Let me give you some of it. The glory of the Lord is on you now. Arise and shine. Lift up your eyes round about and see. And they all gather together and they come to you. Your sons shall come home and your daughters shall be carried home also. I'm going to quit with this story. You remember the um, story when Jesus got off the boat and he walked in this little village and they pointed to a man that was up in the graveyard and they said, he's evil, got evil spirits in him and he was walking around stumping his toe on all those, you know, cornerstones and he was bleeding all over. They say he's crazy, he's insane. And he was just walking around yelling, screaming, yeah, and going through all kinds of gyrations. Now I'm going to move over here to my recovering people. You know what that's like, don't you? That's why we started with the darkness. Because when you smoke crack cocaine, you stay in the dark. You stay in the dark. You stay in the dark. No lights on, no lights at all, no food, no sex, no, no, no brother, no sister, no children, nobody's important. <laughs> you hear me? But the important thing you see in recovery is when they come down, they go insane. It's the closest thing to insanity that I know of to come off of crack cocaine. Am I right? Am I right? So they're walking around, wounded, bleeding all over. And they said to Jesus, he's really doing, he's really upsetting us. We can't do anything with him. And Jesus said, wait a minute. What do you mean you can't do anything? Have you tried? Yes, Lord, we yelled at him. <laughs> Have you tried to listen to him? No, Lord. He acts too funny. Well, have you tried to reach out to him? No, Lord, you know when we're we going to touch him. Well, have you tried to get close and just share your life? No, Lord, no way in the world we're going to do that. So Jesus goes close to him and says, come down. Come down, my brother. And he comes out of the graveyard. Did you hear what I just said? I said he came out of the graveyard. Isn't that something? Could have stayed up there, but he came out of the graveyard. Because Jesus called him. You see? Now, if you've been sanctified... <laughs> You know something about this. I don't care how bad you are, how evil you are. If you've been sanctified, you're going to come out of the grave, y'all. You hear me? You hear me? And so he comes out of the graveyard and Jesus pulls the legion of evil out of him. And they run astray. And then immediately they begin to question Jesus. And Jesus said to him, you are healed. Your faith 
has healed you and he stayed around and, 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 and they would talk to him and say how could you how could you be so sane how could you be so loving we're ready to touch you now we'll come to you now we want to be your brother now and he looked at him and he said I'm on my way I'm getting up I'm going to go tell everybody what has happened to me my brothers and my sisters go tell everybody I want you to tell them that the black community is awake now. Tell them that we've heard enough. We know who we are. We know where we got to go. And we'll come together again after we've been in the trenches for a year or so. But we're going to march. We gonna march. I'm here to announce, I see the chief back there. I'm here to announce that we are going now to go into the Bernal Heights public housing project. And I'm sending word to the pushers and the users and the community over there. We are not coming to push you out. We're coming to love you. It's like, it's, like, it's like the old man said when the prodigal returned and the brother who, who was not feasted, who had been doing everything that, that the father told him to do. And he got so concerned at one point, he said, why are you doing this? Why? And the father said, it is because your brother who was lost is found. It is because your brother who was dead is now alive. Let us feast. Let us rejoice. Let us be together in faith and resistance and never give up. Because we've got one who can call the demons out of anybody's body. And when you got that going for you, you can take any risk because that's, right. that's what faith is. Just yeah. jumping on out there. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right on. Hallelujah. Yeah. just a minute. I want to bring the chief and Captain Herbal up. Anybody here from Valencia Gardens? Come on, Carlene. Come on, residents of Valencia. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come on, residents. Come on, mothers and fathers and children. Come on up here. Come on. Come on up here on the stage. I want you up here with me. Come on. Come on. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Let the chief do that. Hi, Frank. Good to see you. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Captain. Well, the best thing you said today is that you are going to make me a happy man. That's right. Go to I'm glad you're going to go to Yeah. <laughs> now, is the president of the Tenants Association here? 
Colleen Williams. Say something. I'd just like to say, first of all, thank you, Cecil. Thank you for all of your help, all of your cooperation. I feel really, really good today, and I'm not going to preach, Cecil. So. <laughs> I really feel good. I feel proud. It lets me know that all of my hard work, all of my running to meetings, all of my praying, come on, come on, a little cursing, <laughs> but it all paid off. Yeah. And there are some other great things that are coming together for us at Valencia Gardens. Some things that I can't mention right now, but eventually everybody will know about it. Yeah. But <clears throat> that's all right. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. It's it's just great. All right. I used to always say when I first took the position or was put in the position as president, Valencia Gardens. I had, I had been asked to speak at an assembly for SFOP, and my closing words were, my ambition was to have Valencia Gardens, a place that everybody would be proud to come to, and a place that the people that live there would be proud to live in. And I see all of this coming to pass. And all I can say is, Thanks to Cecil, to all the other organizations that have worked with me and have gone into Valencia Gardens with me and for the health department, the police department, uh, department of social services, the school system, we're all coming together. And most of all, not last and certainly not least, thank you Jesus. Alex, Alex. Say something. Uh, take your time, though. I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, as everybody knows, I'm the next drug dealer, and uh, I first want to start by saying uh, thank you to Cecil William and his one wonderful wife, Jan, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be anywhere near this place, anywhere close to doing the things that I've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, only if we had more people like them, then maybe we'd be able to make some kind of a change. And the reason why I say this is because when I was selling drugs, I wasn't doing it because I liked it or I enjoyed it. I did it because I had to do it because it's all I knew to do. Uh, <laughs> I think the main thing that I was trying to do was find a way out, which is what a lot of young drug dealers are doing today, is trying to find a way out so that just maybe they'd be able to find themselves, which is exactly what I was doing. Um, <laughs> man, um, <laughs> um, in the process, I've, I've experienced gang-related behavior. Drugs using, drinking. I've experienced shootouts, but at the same time, consider myself a good person because I never stole from no one, and I never hurt any of these people who didn't have anything to do with the life. Um, what I found was my problem, though, was uh, which was my addiction, was making fast money. You see. It took me being hospitalized from stab wounds. It took me going to jail. It took seeing friends of mine who was around me every day coming up dead to realize. Oh boy. <laughs> it, took, it took me taking a downfall by losing everything I own, including my family, to, re to realize and understand the flip side of drugs and money, which was love, education, and recovery. Uh, 
One thing that I'd like to say that I'm getting tired of is hearing people talk about how bad the drug dealers are. When really I feel the problem is not the drug dealers, the problem is the people who's letting the drugs in, you see. I'm not going to mention no names, but it's people like the CIA and the people in Congress who sell drugs to kids like us and say that we're the problem. I mean, don't get me wrong, I understand that yes, it takes education to get a decent job, but what about the people who, who fail in school and don't even get involved with drugs? Them two are people who need counseling and need recovery. And I'm trying to tell you, we need to do something now before it's too late. Because we're all suffering the same pain. It doesn't matter whether you're black, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Indian. If you're not white, you're black. And the only person that's going to help a black man is a black man. I think the problem is a, lot, is a lot of people out there are scared and they hide. They hide from themselves, they hide from the truth, they hide from the problems that go on in the world, which I feel makes them no better than the drug dealers themselves, because by them not getting involved, it's letting the problem happen, so they're no better than them. I think it's people like them. I, I don't know why they do it. Maybe because they feel it's their right. But I, I think it's people like, like them who are afraid to fall and bump their heads. But I, don't, I may be wrong, but I think it's people like Martin Luther King and the people who, 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 who marched with them who got more than a bump on their head. They got clubbed over the head with sticks and clubs for just for, for everyone to be treated equal and have that right. So I think, I think people don't have that right. I think maybe they had the right but was given to you to use constructively constructively for the good for the people and the good for the children not for the worst for the people you see it doesn't matter if you start living it up now to the day you die thinking that you don't want because you beat the system by living your long and happy life because what a lot of people fail to realize is that you've left your children behind and the problem that you've ran from has eventually come knocking at their door Well, what do you think is going to happen then? If you think what I think you're thinking, you're wrong. Because what's going to happen, the first thing that's going to come to mind is they're going to do what you taught them. And, and you, those of you folks know who you are. And the first thing that's going to come to mind is run. And the problem is going to chase them till they can't run no more and it's going to push them to the edge to where they have no ground to stand on. And they're going to just leave them with two choices. Bite into it or jump the edge. Either way it goes, your children have lost. So you really didn't win after all. I mean, you can be an, excuse me, but you can be an asshole about it and say, well, better him than me, but I'll be damned I think that way about my son because I love my child. And I'm sure you all love your children too. You done never took the time to be here today. Before I finish this, um, I was wondering if everyone could do me a favor and shake the hand to the person sitting next to you. Can you, can you all do that for me? And remember, everybody, Everybody, love your brothers, love your sisters, stick together, for the people is your power. God bless y'all. Peace. Both of them, go on. Say something. Well, I hope that all the energy and the support that's up here on the stage can be translated back out there into the audience because the, the support base is here. They have done something that they've accomplished together, showing that it can be done. Here we have people in Valencia Gardens Housing Project who had difficulty with drugs, with assaults, robberies, burglaries, and they had lost hope. They had given up feeling that nobody else could help them. This is a desolate, difficult situation where you can't accomplish anything. They began from the bottom with support base from, as you heard already, from different city agencies, but so much more important from community-based people, people like all of you, people who came from Glide Church, who said, 
we will stand alongside of you. We will give you what you need, that sense of hope for the future, some pride in you yourselves as people, and you can set the tone. And when you set the tone, you can accomplish anything. They have done so. What well, we have seen what happened in the last two months at Valencia Gardens speaks volumes. They have used their action, not words, to get the job done, and it's beautiful to see what's coming together out the Valencia Gardens. I'll I'll tell you, as a chief of police, what I've heard here today, I support a thousand percent, and I can say why. I stand here before you, and I would not ever want to look at playing a numbers game. Police chiefs can many times arrest thousands of people, but if you arrest people for drugs, crack cocaine, what do you accomplish if you have no long-term solution? And the solution is just what I'm seeing here today, that it's not just the police as partners to help you in your support base. You in the community set the tone for your neighborhood. We are there to give you the assistance and backup support you need to get the job done. But there, is, there has to be health and education, recreation. We know all the things you need to pull people up by the bootstraps to show that there is a sense of belonging. There is a sense that you have pride in your future. We do care about you. Those are the success stories that the people behind us here today have shown. And this ripple effect, I hope, from the Valencia Gardens will go on to every other public housing area in San Francisco. They have my total support. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. As I stand before you this morning, I am undoubtedly the happiest police captain in San Francisco. <laughs> I can go further and say that I am probably the happiest police captain in the state of California. Let me tell you why. I had a conversation with the Reverend Williams this week, and I said to the Reverend, we have made and I'm talking about everyone when I say we. I'm not talking about the police department. We play a very small role. We, these people, have made such tremendous strides at Valencia Gardens. I said to the Reverend Williams, please, when I think of the Bernal projects at Folsom and Army, I think of an aspirin about the size of a basketball. I said, Reverend, we need help there. And he paused. And he said, let me think about it. <laughs> Reverend, you have made me the happiest police captain in San Francisco and in California because you said, and I heard you, and these folks heard you. <laughs> and you said, you're coming to the Bernal Project. We are. We are. are we? And we in the San Francisco Police Department, especially the officers at Mission Station, will be right there with everyone, with you and the group, Glide Memorial, and all the folks you bring. Thank you. Please come. All right. Thank you. Well, my brothers and my sisters, what we've tried to do is to dramatize recovery from a personal and individual basis to a public and community basis. We hope that it has spoken to you. The tape that you saw, the videotape that you saw about the public housing project is available, by the way. And there will be other tapes that will be available later on as well. But uh, let me thank you. And I want to thank all of our brothers and sisters here. See, what we tried to do is show you, dramatize to you, that it can't be done with just one group. You got to have your mayor, you got to have your chief of police, you got to have the housing authority. It's just been magnificent. Where is, where is Deborah Morrison? Where are you? Come here, Deborah. Don't be sitting back. Why are you sitting back there? <laughs> is David back there? David, come on up here. Why you come on up here? The the housing the Oh he had a dental appointment. <laughs> the 
Department of Social Service, the Health Department, the Park and Rec, everybody. You've just been magnificent. We are pulling it off together. This is Deborah. Deborah is from the Public Housing Project. I want you to go back home and ask your public housing director or HUD in your community to give you the latest information that they have. Because if once you read that, it just gives you all kinds of things that you can do as well. Let me thank you so very much for this experience. Now let me detail one or two things while you stand here. The mayor's luncheon will take place in the next 15 minutes. We'll begin at 12.15. We have workshops this afternoon. And then after the workshops, for those of you that like to, our computer learning center will be open from 5 to about 7 o'clock. Beginning at 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, we'll have the live TV show from Glide Sanctuary. Now, each of you has a, a ticket in your folder. You must sign that. I would suggest that most of you get there. It says no later than 8.30, but I would suggest you get there early, more like 8.00. 